politics is a deceiving game. It's a game of no truth. People are deceived day in, day out. Welcome back to another episode of the Black Excellence series. If you have not yet subscribed to my channel, then you know what to do. Join the revolution and click the subscribe button so that you do not miss out on any of these amazing videos. And as always, we're going to hop straight into it. Hi ma'am, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you, Benita? I am so amazing. Thank you so much for sitting with us today. Can you tell us about yourself? Who are you? Where do you come from? What do you do? Um, my name is Adela Mida. Uh, originally, I come from Eastern Cape in Pizana, uh, but I grew up in Flagstaff. I'm a public speaker. I speak on, on, on leadership. I speak as a motivational speaker, inspirational speaker. I'm a conference um, a facilitator and moderator. I'm a debate moder moderator. I'm a transformational coach. I, I assist people who have got um, inhibiting personal issues that um, you know hold their progress in life and uh, enable them and give them tools and powers that will enable them to move forward and build life. Um, I'm also a corporate lady. Um, I mean, I'm a businesswoman as well. I'm a mother. I'm everything that you can think of, but most importantly, I'm a woman. According to you, who and what is a woman? A woman is a giant source of creation. A woman is a societal well where every thirst is quenched. A woman is an embrace storage and a processing engine that gives society wisdom. But also a woman is a hand that holds her society together. Everything that has got a touch of a woman, no matter how broken it can be, it shall get mended. What made you want to start an NGO and how did you go about it? I was um, practically at the age of 18. You can imagine uh, back then, I mean, I was in high school and it was not even in a place that um, I, I, I grew up in. But it was after I had observed that, um, you know, the society I was living in at the time, which was Port St. John's, I mean, it recently was on the news for floods. Um, you know, a lot of girl children at the time were coming from, um, you know, destitute, destitute families. They were coming from child-headed homes. They were coming from homes where you could um, literally see that there is no, um, you know, um, order of discipline and authority and guidance and whatnot and support and embrace. And and, and for me, that, that, that projected to me at the time, because I mean, as much as I was 18 at the time, but that was the life that has, has defined who I have been all my life as a young girl, I've, I've been this lonely girl who does not have an order of authority, who has got no support, has got no structure, has got no embrace, literally walking the journey alone with no one who is, you know, carrying your hand and holding you and saying, today when it's raining, it's going to rain on you, but I'm going to be here with you. So it, it, it took me to my own journey and it made me feel that th there must be a way in which we can make life easy and better for one another regardless of whether i have encountered these difficulties i did not need to then look and do nothing when the next person encountered those difficulties hence the ngo became a driving force and a driving need for me to say through the ngo i can be able to create a platform where girls can merge and they can be able to share experiences and they can also be able to see and relate to each other's struggles right. that was important for me mm -hmm. Now, you stand for women, but one thing I've noticed about your form of activism or standing for women is that you are not shy in giving women accountability or holding them responsible for their actions, which in this time is hardly ever done. I mean, I think in this time, people tend to tiptoe around, you know, the responsibilities of women. So can you speak more about that and what made you actually say, no, I'm going to protect the woman, but I'm going to hold the woman accountable. And what do you think about movements such as men are trash that are going on right now? 
For me, the most important thing is that once you stand up to fight for anything or advocate for anything, you need to at least have the ability to own up to anything that relates to that which you claim you are standing for. I can't be an activist that is advocating for anything that is about women. If my activism is about projecting women as angels, that is not activism, none whatsoever. Society will never be fixed by us looking at society through the lenses of wanting to fix, but in our pursuit of fixing the society, we plant seeds of deepening the wrong that we are calling out. My form of activism has taught me one thing, or at least two things. It has taught me that fighting for or standing up for women issues, I must first understand that women have and will be contributing factors to some of the ills that we are, stri we are trying to eradicate from our society. Once we accept that reality, we will then be able to always put ourselves as women at the center of accountability for all the actions. For instance, when we say no to gender-based violence, we can't in the same line say no, there is no women, there's no woman who abuse a man. That's not true. We've got men in this country, at least here in South Africa, we do have men who have passed on who have died at the hands of their women partners. I mean, I can make an example, a popular one, is Shaba. He was stabbed by his girlfriend. Do you want to tell me that as activists, as women activists, we must condemn when Sandile kills Garabo, but be silent when a woman kills Shaba? That's not the kind of activism that I'm about. The kind of activism that I'm about is the one that says, as women, we must understand that contextually, we are located in society as epitome of creation. We are a symbolic foundation of everything that comes to existence. By virtue of understanding that, we ought to fight for holistic issues in society, not for issues that are personally directed to women. And as we fix that which is wrong in society, we can't fix it because it's for women. We fix it because it's for the entire society. If you are fighting for women equality, who are you saying needs to be equal to a woman? Have you taken time and locate where a woman is in society? Because if you are saying, for instance, you are fighting for women equality, you need to answer the question, is a woman, in as far as your own understanding, is a woman projected at the lower level of life? As a result, a woman needs to be lifted up? Or is a woman located at a key and a strategic level in life? As a result, we need to bring the rest of the things to where a woman is. That is how contextually we need to look at the woman equality. In your work as a public and motivational speaker, you were actually invited to the White House in America in the time of President Obama and you shared the stage with Michelle Obama. That is an amazing, <laughs> amazing opportunity. How did that come to happen and how do you ensure that you keep getting more of these opportunities as a motivational and public speaker? You know, there's nothing in life as, as rewarding as doing what is your purpose and getting noticed for it mm. without shouting. When I first got a call from the consular, US consular offices when I was in Cape Town, and um, they said that uh, they're inviting me to a conference meeting with President Barack Obama. At first I was like, no, 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 I'm sure it's a wrong person. There's nothing that links me with the President of America. I, we don't know each other. The, the, I'm sure she, he, does, he does not know anyone called Anil That It's not possible that I could be the person who's being called for a conference. And it was, in fact, true. Mm. I was, um, I mean, I was first um, chauffeur driven to the, the offices and indeed when I arrived there, we were linked on the boardroom there on Skype with President Barack Obama. Ah, this man is real. This thing is real. 
And I mean, um, the first thing he told me was that it, um, he has the program that um, is focusing on young, excellent African leaders in office. At the time, I was a member of parliament, amongst the youngest members of parliament in, in the Republic of South Africa. And um, I happened to be one of the people that he had his tabs on me. I don't know how. We shared about four public platforms with both President Barack Obama and Michelle. And since then, I mean, we've kept, um, you know, contact and, and lines of friendship. Things that you never thought that you, you would share friendship circle with the person of Michelle Obama's caliber. But th those again, um, for me, Benita, th th those again are affirmations that come to you when you, when you receive yourself and you cement yourself in the center of what the universe keeps on unleashing about how big you are, how great you are. But you don't carry that with a chip on your shoulder to say, I'm this great person. Receive the greatness that the, the, that the universe affirms on you, but keep yourself as humble as possible because that's when the universe keeps projecting you, giving to higher, um, you know, strides and higher heights and higher platforms. And for me, that has been a major highlight of my life, which I, I hardly speak about because it's not something that I want to be defined with. But it's equally something that I'm never ashamed to make reference of because it's something that happened. It's a chapter in my history in, of my existence, which is most important. As you mentioned, um, you're one of the members of parliament, one of the youngest, you know. Can you list three things that you wish you knew about politics before you ever entered it? Firstly, one of the things I wish I knew about politics before I will find myself like haywire into it is the fact that politics is a deceiving game. It's a game of no truth. People are deceived day in, day out. In this day and age, as I'm sitting here today, even this government that the people of South Africa has is a deceiving government. There's no truth in politics. There is no, there's nothing that's about selfless serving in politics. In politics before, you can talk about building a house for a destitute person on the street. You talk about the, the unending cycle of comrades here if it moves from me, it goes to my comrade, then this comrade, to her comrade, and that comrade, and that comrade. And by that time, the ordinary people who are expecting the service on the ground, they are being given a road deal, and it's never going to change. That's one thing I wish I had known. Secondly, when I was in parliament, there's something that happened. There was a scheme or a scam where members of parliament were abusing the travel um, claim uh, benefit, where you find that when a person is supposed a person is supposed to fly from Cape Town to Joburg, they would rather drive because driving means that they are going to accumulate a lot of kilometers, and that means they instead of um, maybe a two thousand um, a, a two thousand single flight, um, they are going to register maybe a, a thirty thousand a single trip going and register a thirty thousand as a trip return. So that means they're going to score in one trip they're going to score plus minus sixty or seventy thousand. You know, um, it went to a point where Parliament made um, put up an investigation. Um, the IFP president at that time called me and said to me, you know what, you're a very young girl, you're very dignified. You, the way in which you're doing your work is so ethical. I've seen the report of Parliament on anything that is untoward. Your name is not mentioned. Keep that. For me, that was profound. And that spoke to the fact that when you do good, and when you project yourself in the manner in which you are, people receive you for who you are. So there's not much that you needed to do to be noticed. And that's what gave also the game of politics has become these days. It's about people being noticed for fuzzy things, not substance um, issues. Those are the things that I think I wish I would have known before I went to, into politics. But thank God I've managed to project myself, to keep myself true to who I am. Because being in politics for me is also continuing the legacy of my grandfather who brought me into politics. Someone who was very ethical in his, his serving and someone who was about people, nothing else. Mm. So being someone who is in politics, you are in the public eye. And you mentioned that Barack Obama himself said he was keeping tabs on you. You have people who are watching you, but unfortunately, it's not always praises of that course. you receive, and it's not always truth mm -hmm. that is projected in the media. How do you deal with negative and false news that has been spread about you all over media? Well, one of the things that I've gotten to accept is that, first of all, not everyone would love Anilemda. Not everyone would love to see Anilemda going whichever side Anile goes. 
and not everyone will be impressed by Amelim Dam. So the first thing I did was to accept that reality that I don't seek to be, uh, to be accepted by everyone. I don't seek to be loved by everyone. I don't seek to do anything for praises. I do what I feel talks to me. I do what I think define my principles. I do what I feel project who I'm about and what am I about. If it happens that there will be a person who would not be pleased by that, if there is a constructive lesson for me to take, oh, with all pleasure, I take a lesson. If it's all an attack that seeks to destroy and bash me, I switch off because I understand that not everyone will love what I do. Not everyone will welcome what I do. And not everyone will always cheer what I do. So it's, it's really accepting things that you've got ability and courage of doing and those that you don't have uh, the ability of and you've got control, you've got no control over, accept them and move on. Mm. We are sitting here, we're doing the Black Excellence Series interview, but I want to know from your side, what is Black Excellence? Oh wow, one thing that I'm very passionate about. You know, for me, Black Excellence is a total embrace of ourselves as Black people without explaining ourselves. It's a total recognition of the fact that we are an ongoing creation of a source that was too powerful to be defeated, that still remains too strong to be broken. Black Excellence is about a united force of Black people who are unapologetically Black and who are unapologetic in their excellence, who do not seek to be affirmed by anyone that they are, they are Black in their excellence and they can excel in their Blackness. Something that I like to do at all the right. end of all my interviews is I have here a bowl of tongue twisters. All right. And you get to choose one and say as fast as you can in 30 seconds. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Tongue twisters in 30 seconds, as fast as I can. <sighs> what? <Wow. laughs> in three, two, one, go. <laughs> okay, round the rough and rock the rock, the wreck, rascal, rudely wreck. <laughs> Okay, you still have 18 seconds. Okay. okay. Round the rough and the rag of rock, the rag of rusk and root you rag. Yes! Got it! Well, that is black excellence, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Annie Linda. I'm a public speaker, transformational coach, and a conference moderator. You are now watching the Black Excellence series coming to you live from the offices of Benita Daniels. Perfect. Thank you. you. That's it for today, guys. I hope you like this video. Don't forget to comment, like, share, and Click subscribe and subscribe. Yes, <laughs> subscribe. <laughs> and I will be back with more videos. Peace and love, guys.